my name is Sandy Lynn Stelt, and I am here with my neighbor Jenny Carney, and we're going to kind of do a different way of doing a keynote speech today. We're going to tell you our story and kind of give you the timeline, and um, hopefully you will see sort of how two people who never met each other, uh, our lives kind of intersected in a not so great way, but it turned out to be a great way. Right. So. Um, so let me tell you my story and how it started. I um, met my husband, Joel, in 1985. Joel was a social worker, and I was running a day program for people with disabilities. And Joel would come in, and I would flirt with him, and he would be totally oblivious. And then I um, was hanging out with some of his social worker friends and said, he should ask me out. This was way back in the day when guys had scales out. Um, and he was totally oblivious. And then he left town, and I didn't see him for a while. And then all of a sudden he called me out of the blue and asked me to go out. So we were hiking, and then we went for dinner. And um, I said, what made you decide to ask me out? And he said, well, I decided I wanted to get serious, so I made a list of 10 women that I thought would go out with me. <laughs> a, a way to get better. He said, you were number five on the list, and the first four turned me down. <laughs> His sister is here. Is that not true? Yes. So, I thought I should stab him, because I had a fork in my hand. <laughs> but then I thought to myself, you know, there was, a, there was a time in my life where I just wanted somebody who would be like straightforward and, and just to the point. And he was either an idiot or he was straight to the point. And it turned out he was a little bit of both, but more straight to the point, okay? So we dated, we lived together, we got married um, in 91, and then in 1992 we were looking for our first house. And we found what we thought was a beautiful location. It was um, up in Belmont, which if you know Belmont, is just north of Grand Rapids, a little suburb, just to the west of Rockford. And what we loved about this was it was surrounded by Christmas trees. Now at that time, Joel was a children's protective services worker, and I was a psychologist working with people with chronic mental illness. And so the number one goal we had was no human contact. By the time we got home, we didn't want to talk to people, see people, hear people. So Christmas tree farms were kind of the niche. We loved it. We loved nature. We loved all of this. So we moved in in 92. We led the most boring, dull lives you've ever had. We'd take vacations to the UP or down to the Smoky Mountains. We'd complain about gas prices. We'd watch Jeopardy. We'd play Scrabble. It was about as boring as you can get. In 2016, we were getting ready to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary, and we were going to go out west to see some family, and then we were going to go to Banff, that had always been our dream vacation, and Joel was having some stomach issues, so we, um, he went in and they thought he had a hernia, and so they did the hernia repair, and three days later, they called us to say that, in fact, he had stage four liver cancer. And he died three weeks later. Um, now, no grief is easier or harder than another, so I would not compare this to somebody losing a parent or a child or a friend. But when you lose your spouse, when you lose your partner, you know, he was my hero. He was my best friend. It's like learning to tie your shoe again. And so um, life was difficult, and I had to move forward. And so um, that is the background story of where I started. Thank you. Um, oh, you this is Joel. He's the tall one. <laughs> 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 okay, so I apologize. I just put your uh, slide on there. Yeah. Um, is my microphone working okay? Okay. Um, my name is Jenny Carney. Thank you for having us. Um, it's a beautiful location. Um, I'm here today to share what my family and neighbors and community have been going through for the last three years. 
Um, this was all due to mismanagement of toxic chemicals um, dumped in the, the woods. Um, like Cindy had said, we um, live outside of Rockford, north of Grand Rapids. We don't have any industry by us. Uh, Wilbur and Worldwide decided to um, dump their toxic chemicals at this location and um, to do so kind of wash it away by using the groundwater. So while that was happening, they sat idly by while Sandy's house was built, while my house was built, and we moved in and nothing was said. I want to make sure that we have adequate laws that make sure that that type of action doesn't happen again um, so that no more, no more people are unknowingly contaminated. I've always lived in northern Kent County. Most of my life has actually been in Rockford, uh, so I know the area really well. Never knew about the dump site. Um, my son and my husband and I, we lived in downtown Rockford for a while. Um, and then in 2010, I had my daughter, Kendall, and that was the same year that the tannery was torn down. And we were pretty excited because I don't know if you've ever been to Rockford, when the tannery was running, it stunk. Everybody would say it's the Rockford steam. So we were pretty excited that we didn't have to smell it anymore. But then we get a letter from the city that we would all have to contribute more to our water bills. And so with having two kids and our house was small, now this added bill, property taxes were high in Rockford. We decided to move, get a larger home, and we found um, our house there where all the kids are by the swimming pool. That was the best part because we all the time had that many people at our house all summer. That's where everybody would go. Um, it was really, it was like our dream home, like everything that's on our checklist, it, it met everything. It was really hard with both the kids in daycare to afford our dream home, um, but we kind of went through, we called it like the couple years that we didn't eat meat because meat's expensive, so we <laughs> ate mac and cheese and ramen. Um, but after a couple years of living in this home that we really enjoyed, um, I started to get sick. Um, it kind of started with having the headaches, um, and then I was having a lot of eye pain, and then I would notice that one day I could see the TV just fine, and then the next day I couldn't read anything that's on it. Um, I started having like random numbness. My legs would go numb, my arms would go numb, um, and then I was having twitching. Um, so I started going to a whole array of different doctors. They did all kinds of tests. They ruled out different diseases. They just couldn't figure out what was going on. So I was sustaining with medication and doses of steroids. Um, and that's kind of how it went. And it just kept getting worse. And so the, it was the end of 2016 that I had told my husband, you know, we really need to put together a trust, put a will together. Um, the bottom corner there, I'm sorry. Um, the end of 2016, we moved to Mexico for a family vacation. We took money out of our savings because I wanted to see my kids have a great time. We swam with the turtles. We had a great time um, all together on vacation. And then um, it was after that that we, we kind of figured out what was going, what was going on. So, in 2017, it's a year after Joel passed away, and I go for a walk, because walking in the sunshine is actually really good for depression and grief. Um, I come back, and there's a bunch of government employees at my driveway who say, out of an abundance of caution, we would like to test your water for this thing called PFAS. Now, they could have been testing my water for Cheerios. I had no idea what PFAS was. And what the heck, I'm by myself. Sure, come on in, test my water. I'll make you some cookies. Let's just have a party with it. Um, I joked with them that hopefully you had learned your lesson from Flint. And they said, why, well, yes, that's why we're doing this. We don't think there's any problem, but we want to test your water. 
Three weeks later, I get a call, and six cars of government employees show up at my door to give me my test results. Now, I don't know how many people here work in government, but I will give you a clue. If six cars of government employees show up, it is never good news. They are not delivering publishers' clearinghouse, okay? They are coming to give you bad news. So I had somebody from MDHHS, the health department, I had a toxicologist, I had DEQ, I had this place called GZA, uh, which I will explain later. I had three people from Department of Environmental Quality. They said my water had tested positive for PFAS. PFAS is per and polyfluoroalkylene <coughs> substances. It's a class of chemicals that is used um, to waterproof things. It's virtually indestructible. That's why they call it a forever chemical. There's 4,000 different types of PFAS chemicals, and I won't bore you with all the different chains and analysis. My water tested at 27,000 parts per trillion. Now, if you don't know anything about PFAS, I wasn't sure if like, I won an award or if I was going to die, because they didn't explain that part. Eventually, they told me, well, the EPA set a health advisory standard of 70 parts per trillion and I was at 27,000. Hmm. I said, so is that bad? I was really saying that to buy time because you know, I didn't know what the heck to think. Um, they said it has to be an error because I don't know that we've ever had groundwater that somebody has drank this high. So at that point I high-fived them and said, go big or go home, that's kind of my life, you know. They came back two weeks later and it tested and found that it was 38,000 parts per trillion. My water has been tested every week since then and has been as high as 88,000 parts per trillion. Um, it turns out that the Christmas tree farm that we loved in the 70s was actually a dump site for Wolverine worldwide. Wolverine made hush puppy shoes and they still make shoes. They would take truckloads of tannery waste, which included Scotchgard, and they would bring it over to the 90 acres there. They would dig troughs, and they would dump it in, truckload after truckload after truckload. When that trough got full, they would cover it and dig another trough and fill it up. When the, all the troughs got filled and it started smelling, they punched through to the clay lining and then punched through to the aquifer and dumped it into the um, groundwater, which is now flowing towards the Grand River. <laughs> My house lives, is directly across from the dump site, so I was the first location for this. Um, at the time, though, this was in the 70s, by the time we moved in, this was a Christmas tree farm, which is the perfect cover for a toxic waste site. Keep in mind, it wasn't just PFAS that was in there. It's mercury, it's arsenic, it's chromium, it's hexachromium. It's just a variety of chemicals um, that are in there that have contaminated things. Um, I knew it was dangerous when they started unloading uh, bottles of water and they started handing me gift cards for Meyer. It wasn't because they wanted me to have a great Labor Day picnic. Um, they informed me not to drink the water. They thought bathing in the water was okay, though now we know that dermal contact is every bit as toxic as <coughs> ingesting this chemical. Um, they thought that maybe if they just put an um, under the sink filter, that that would be okay. Though we pointed out that most of us don't just drink water from our kitchen tap. You know, you get up at night and you get a glass of water out of your bathroom and you brush your teeth and you do all this. That day, when they brought in jugs of water, I knew my life had changed. I remember calling my sister-in-law and saying, well, if you thought life was weird last year, wait till you hear this year. And she burst into tears and said, oh my God, that's what killed Joel. So it was the end of 2017. What had happened um, at Sandy's house and on her street uh, was apparently on the news and we totally missed it. Um, I was busy with, my daughter had started 
swim, school was starting up, my son was in a marching band in high school, which a marching band parent, that is like your entire life. Um, so there was one evening when we came home and my son found the letter from the law firm um, in Grand Rapids, Firehome. They're a large law firm. They had left a, a letter on our doorstep. So he gave it to my husband and then when I got home from work, he showed it to me and I was like, drinking water contamination, we shouldn't drink our water. There's like nothing around here. And I kind of took it serious because Varnum, I mean, they're not gonna just, you know, try to seek out some people to drum up business. Um, this was, I was thinking, legitimate. But we didn't have time to go to their informational meeting. But some of our neighbors did. And when they got back from it, they were like, this is actually something real. We need to stop drinking our water. Um, so I, at the time, worked in a construction project management office. So I took that letter to work, and I was like, have you guys ever heard of this PFAS stuff? And they had no idea what it was, so I Googled it. There was, like, nothing that I could understand that was on the internet. Um, thankfully, that's changed. You can Google it and find some good information now. Um, so a few weeks later, the DEQ and Health Department, um, they held a, a town hall, and it was in the auditorium of my old high school. I was not a fan of high school, so it was so weird going back, sitting in that auditorium, and then looking at the screen, and there's this map, this uh, satellite map, and there's a small circle of homes, which included Sandy's home and those on my street, and it was just the weirdest feeling to just be sitting there. It was kind of like watching a movie of this happening to somebody else. <clears throat> so a couple weeks after that, they tested um, the water on the homes and on my street. And there's a row of four of us. And we had always um, been friends and hung out. We have trails cut between our homes and our kids play together. And coincidentally, when the water results came back, um, it was those four homes that were high. Um, my first test was 150 parts per trillion, um, but the test that came back a couple months ago was 600 parts per trillion. Um, there was a lot of, obviously, a lot of feelings you don't, it is just, it, it kind of blows your mind. And I think back to how many kids swam in that pool. Um, my son's best friend had thyroid cancer. He came over, he drank my water. Um, our friend's son has a brain tumor. He would come over and swim in the pool all the time because it felt good on his body. Um, my grandma had uterine cancer, and she would come over to hang out and, of course, drink the water. So you just feel this immense amount of guilt. Although you didn't do anything wrong, you know, you know, in the forefront that you didn't do anything wrong, but you still, you're the one who served up that water. Um, so the remainder of 2017, was it was fearful to look at the news because it was almost every night there was a new news story and it was about your house i always kind of made this joke because we do very random things at home and i'm like that's fine you guys can do that just don't land on the news and there we were like on the news every single night it was it was totally crazy um so that was that initial circle of homes the blue slip that you see here is how all the other homes found out. This is a slip from Wolverine's uh, contractors, their, their environmental group, and they would just leave a slip in the door. So you would kind of see these posts on Facebook like, oh, we got a slip in the door. I guess we're contaminated. So then they would get their house test. And so it was just on and on for months with these blue slips and deliveries of water. It was, it was the weirdest. <laughs> <laughs> Time. So, oh, can you go back? Oh, yeah. So I wanted to show, this right here is um, across the street from my house. So you can see this sign here <laughs> is what Wolverine had posted to say, um, I don't know what it says. <laughs> it says, well, I don't know what it says. It's rusted. And it was um, evidently put there to say, don't go in here because there's bad juju or something. <laughs> These barrels right here were right outside my, um, on the property right next to mine. Um, now, 
keep in mind, this is a rural area, and I'm not, I'm not used to rural areas, so I don't, I knew the barrels didn't grow there, I knew that, <laughs> but I had no clue that barrels like that were full of toxic sludge. Um, it wasn't until Garrett Ellis and Event Life came over and um, started looking through there that we figured out there were like 30 barrels buried literally next to my property line, literally where Joel would take my nephews to go play, um, to explore, and um, it was full of toxic things. So when the summer hit and we got our test results, I went for a walk and met my neighbors, who I had never met before, none of us knew each other, because we lived on pretty big parcels of land. And um, the first, I knew they had gotten test results because they were sitting there with bottled water and papers in their hands, and it was in summer, so I kind of joked and went, ah, oh, we're in the same boat here. And Ryan said, my name's Ryan, and I said, I'm Sandy, and he said, you want a beer? And we've been tight ever since then. Um, his wife and I got together that night and fired up the Google machine, and there was not a lot written about PFAS, and this was 2017, it wasn't that long ago. We found articles by Garrett Ellison, we found articles by Sharon Lerner at Intercept, and we learned about this thing called the C8 study about Parkersburg, West Virginia, where DuPont had contaminated um, the river and the groundwater and a farmer's um, plot of land and the fight that went on with that. So we started, the more we read, the more we thought this is not good. So we got the neighbors together at my house one night. So it's August, it's raining. I suddenly figure out there's like 20 kids in my neighborhood that are all now wanting to be in my house, oy vey. So they played outside in the rain. All the neighbors came inside. It was like a PFAS AA meeting, I'm telling you. We would go around and say, my name's Sandy, and here's my levels, and my name's Ted, and here's my levels. And so we decided we had to strategize as a neighborhood. There were probably 20 homes in this area. And we decided three things. We decided, number one, we were not going to talk to the media. That didn't last that long. Number two, we decided that Wolverine was a good company and they were going to probably take care of us. And hopefully they would give us free shoes. I swear to God, we were like, what if we got like four pair of Merrill a year? <laughs> How cool would that be? Maybe for life. This would be amazing. And then we thought, should we get a lawyer? And we decided, nah, we can talk to Wolverine. <laughs> Luckily, the next day, we called this lawyer we found out of um, Cincinnati called Rob Alot. Now, if any of you have had the chance to see Dark Waters, or the devil you know, if you haven't, write that down. That's your homework assignment for the week. Go see these movies, they're amazing. Rob Ballot is the attorney that uh, was involved in the C8 study, and he's amazing. So we called him and said, here's what we got going. Initially, he said he would come and represent us, but then he thought maybe it was too small of a group. But his advice was the following. One, get a lawyer. Get a really good lawyer. Don't get your cousin, you know, Rick, who does divorce law. Get a really good lawyer. Number two, get a point of entry filter, which means a filter that's going to filter all your water when it comes into your home. Don't let them just give you an under the sink filter. And number three, don't settle for shoes. See point number one. That's what he said very clearly. Like, don't go for the shoe settlement. And in fact, don't talk to Wolverine. So we decided not to. The next week, I'm at home working, and all of a sudden, every news truck shows up in my driveway. And Grand Rapids has got a pretty good news group there. So they all show up. I remember I have a big bay window. I have a home office, and I have a big bay window, and I lay down the floor so they couldn't see me inside the house. <laughs> and literally, I'm laying on the floor, and I call my friend, and I'm like, you're not going to believe this. Channel 8's there, Channel 13's there, Channel 5's there. There's all these other people there, what do I do? And her response was, oh my God, you're like the Kardashians, this is great! We've got to go shopping! So I hung up on her. 
luckily by then I had signed with a law firm and the lawyers at the law firm were able to say, just chill, you don't have to talk to anybody. I think the advice that I got was media is like, no offense to media, media <laughs> is like stray cats, as long as you don't feed them, they will just go away to the next thing. <laughs> but unfortunately, that did not prove to be the case. It was a very slow news day in um, Michigan, and so they hung out greatly. So a month later, they call and say, would a group of you be willing to get together to do a special on Channel 8, our, our um, NBC affiliate? And we said, sure. And they said, well, we're going to have some people from Chandler. Now, this is House Street, and then we had a freeway, and then Chandler is over here. Because I'm not that smart, for some reason I thought water just stayed on our street. Why would it go over to Chandler? But it turns out water does not care about streets or zip codes. It goes wherever the heck water wants to go. And it flows under the freeway to Chandler. So we would jokingly say it was the House Street Gang versus the Chandler Chicks. And we were going to wear gang clothes to the thing. But we all met at a Channel 8 special. And that was how we all met. Yeah, we never did decide colors. We did. Oh, what side was here? We're going to do colors. <laughs> great. Uh, it was great in a weird, kind of bittersweet way to meet uh, those folks on House Street. Um, it was like the worst situation that we were all going through. So to meet somebody else that you can just kind of, you don't even have to talk about it. It's just you know that that person's going through the same thing. It was really a relief. Um, and it was really funny to kind of find out that Chandler, we did the same thing that House Street did. We all found out our results. None of us called the media. We decided instead to have what we call the pity party. So in the middle of our backyards, we all kind of like came together and we had a bottle of wine and drink all day. Um, <laughs> we just were overwhelmed. Um, so as we're pity partying, um, it had gotten a little dark out and then we were sitting there like, who's this guy? Who is coming here? Nobody even knows what we're doing. And it was Channel 8. Um, <laughs> again, it was the, okay, don't ever land on the news. And then this reporter shows up. I don't know how we found out, but they always find out everything. It's so weird. Um, so then it, you know, we got clued in with him, and then we went to the special. And um, the five of us ladies that were on the special, we actually continued to stay together and be a little support network for each other. Um, I have a picture of it in one of the following slides, but I thought it'd be really funny if we named our unofficial group. We're definitely not an official group. We're very unofficial. But we're, um, we drink wine and we talk about water. I said, we should meet on Wednesdays, and then we can abbreviate it WWW, just like Wolverine Worldwide. <laughs> but a couple months ago, as we were in one of our court hearings, um, Wolverine pointed that out to the judge. Do you know those ladies have a group? <laughs> it was very hard not to laugh as we were sitting in court. Um, but that, yeah, the, the, the funny thing with the highway was before those folks on House Street found out, they had also just wanted to test north of House Street. And so it is kind of a running joke that highways don't stop keep us. It can go wherever it wants. And it, that's the, the map that was held in that first town hall, and they were kind of making it appear as though that's all it was going to be. This is how it is now. Um, everything that's shaded on that map are areas that are contaminated. It's a 25 square mile area. So this kind of shows that, that map um, near Sandy, the red houses are everything that's over 70 parts per trillion. And the yellow is um, <coughs> detection level. And there's not very many green, um, which would mean green is good, you passed. Um, it turns out that there was another dump site where it says here on Woven Jewel. And we learned a lot about ge geology. We had a geology one-on-one. -on -one. Um, my daughter calls it being a rock star because she now wants to be a geologist. 
She's probably like the only kid that found a well report super interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, our yards are very sandy and gravelly, which would make that uh, purple arrow flow pretty quickly from Sandy's house to my house and down to the river, which then goes into the Grand River and into Lake Michigan. So it was cool finding out about geology. We found out about aquifers. I only knew that, like, I had this pipe in my front yard. I didn't know what a well was, how it worked. Now I know how a well works, how a septic works, and there's aquifers and aquatarts and all this stuff that we had never heard of. Um, so I think that you have a couple of funny run-ins, though, with looking with the geologists and DEQ in your yard. Well. Well, yeah, but probably not for the camera <laughs> stories, so we'll leave that out. Um, <laughs> we did, um, as this, I want to say, this is why media is really important. And I'm, so as we're talking about the intersection of environment and politics, you can't talk about that without talking about media, because media really does play a big part in this. Rockford is a very much a company town. Um, Wolverine really does run the town of Rockford, as we know, because this year they were named Business of the Year, um, which we thought was an article out of the Onion or something. We really didn't believe that they yeah. would do that, but they did get Business of the Year. That's how, how beholden the city of Rockford is, and the Northern Kent County area is to Wolverine worldwide. But because media took this story and ran with it, and started uncovering things, it put a lot of pressure on the responsible party. And so we were able to get these giant whole home filters installed. All of us that tested positive for this got giant whole home filters installed. Now, that's wonderful. I am very thankful and blessed that I have that. I want you to know it took a few tries. It's about the size of a space shuttle. They weren't really sure how to put it in. It's from a leak the day before Thanksgiving, um, so my basement flooded. They came back then and redid it, then came back and checked it and found out they had done it backwards. And so, that, but it, it took a few months, and God bless them for keeping trying, and they did, and they have it in. I'm going to be honest with you, though, none of us trust it. It's a granular activated carbon filter system. I have four giant tanks of carbon that are about my size and the water runs through it and then filters that. So in addition to that, we all have like Culligan water systems that you would have in an office, but that means you have to lug those jugs in and put them in. You gotta figure out where you're gonna store them because they drop them off once a month. I tell you right now, I have three of them in my garage that I noticed this morning are frozen solid. So now I gotta bring them in the house and let them thaw and hope that I don't run out of water before then. Um, so it has been a challenge. We're not a neighborhood where you can grow a garden because the water out of your hose is contaminated with PFAS. And that means your tomatoes and your vegetables are all contaminated. We're not an area where the kids can play in the sprinkler anymore because the water is contaminated with PFAS. This affects every area of your life. Um, it's something that you never really get away with from. So then, in the fall of 2018, I was making dinner, and I saw in the news that Senator Gary Peters was doing a hearing on PFAS contamination. And I thought, to, and it was open to the public in Washington. And so I thought to myself, and I said to my cats, hey, I'm the public, I should go. <laughs> and Spot just kind of licked himself. But Molly, the other cat, agreed. She, I think, I really do think she kind of nodded at me. I'm not sure. She didn't say anything, but she kind of looked like that's a good idea. So I talked to my neighbors, and they were like, are you crazy? We're not going to Washington. But then I remembered some other people I knew. So I called over to Chandler and said, hey, Jenny, what do you think about going to Washington, D.C.? And so we went. We went, and before we went, I called like a stalker to our local media, I, or to our local representatives. I called Senator Gary Peters, Senator Debbie Stabenow, and um, Justin Amash. And those three are the representatives for our area. 
Everybody would tell me, oh, they're not going to really meet with you if you'll meet with their aides, which later I learned is really who you do want to meet with, but because um, they're really the people that put the rubber to the road. But all three of them met with us personally. All three of them listened to us. And how I know they listened to us is we met with Senator Peters at like 1, I think. The hearing was at 2.30, and he told our stories at the hearing. So I know he listened to us. When we got back, we realized we have a lot more power in politics than we give ourselves credit for. We think we're just one person in this like room of however many, but they listen to you if you don't go in there and strip off your clothes and set your hair on fire. <laughs> I'm serious about that. You can't go in there like hysterical. You have to go in there with a compelling story and what you want to have done. So we actually made up business cards. And you know, we put our names and our phone numbers and our title was affected resident. <coughs> and on the back, we listed our goals. We listed that we wanted this listed as a hazardous substance. We wanted the MCLs lower, the maximum contain contaminant levels lower. Um, we wanted there to be some looking for this so that people aren't just taken by surprise like we were. We wanted um, this to be, uh, we wanted health studies and biomonitoring of this. So we listed goals on the back. Because we did have a few state people that when we would meet, they would say, well, come back when you tell, you know, we don't really know what you're looking for. You don't have any goals in mind. And I could flip the card over and go, bingo, there you go. <laughs> and then they would have to listen. Oh, there we are. So we've done a lot since um, just being these lone people who we're all very private. Like Cindy said, we all have large lots. Um, I think the smallest is five acres. We're very, and, and it's all wooded. We just don't converse with each other. We're very private people. Obviously, that's changed. Um, we've accomplished a lot. I didn't know that you could actually go and talk to your representatives. I don't know why. Um, but the funniest thing was when we were in Washington, D.C. So it was myself and Sandy, and then my neighbor Tobin. She just had a baby, so she couldn't come with us. She, um, the, the three of us ladies, we kind of took a couple hours whirlwind tour of D.C., and I'm standing in front of the Capitol building, and I'm like, oh my god, you guys, like, what side do you think that the president lives on? And <laughs> they looked at me like I was crazy. And Tobin, she's good at government, she's like, well, he's in the White House. That's not there. So when I got home, God bless her for saying it, too. Just own it, Jenny. I went on Amazon, and this is what I bought. Um, the Dummies book and the Idiot's Guide. Very helpful. So if somebody who doesn't even know where the president lives, um, can go to D.C. and meet with the representatives and move them to want to take action, literally anybody can do this. Anybody can do this. And they, they do listen to you. It, it's amazing. So since then, um, these are four groups that Sandy and I are both part of. Um, the EPA, they did a host of interviews of different community members. So they have a group that was formed, our community advisory group, and like I said, it's through the EPA. We have monthly meetings, um, and it's just focused on the Wolverine Worldwide sites, um, so we kind of keep that scope of work there. Um, we review the work that they're doing, and they'll also present us with work plans. So our next month's meeting, um, there's a remediation plan for the Rogue River, where they've um, just did a lot of excavation out of to pull out the, the waste. Um, so we'll be able to weigh in on that. Can I just say, the reason that is really important is EPA typically only deals with Superfund sites, which means that it has to be a substance that's considered a hazardous substance. PFAS is not considered a hazardous substance, even though nobody should be drinking scotch bar. But our administration will not label that as a hazardous substance. Typically, they will only do community advisory groups at Superfund sites, but because we were like chihuahuas seeing a dog go by our yard and barked and barked and barked, 
they decided at this point they were willing to do a community advisory group and sponsor it for a non-Superfund site. So we're the first ones to get that for a non-Superfund site. And I think that we've accomplished a lot. Um, we were able to, they had this really great idea that they were going to excavate the materials out of the tannery, which is in downtown Rockford by the Rockford Dam, if you've ever been there. And where were they going to put the materials? But at House Street. Um, they were allowed to dump it on another piece of land that they own. We came back with, well, you have your corporate headquarters, go park it, like, put it in your parking lot. <laughs> we'll put it in House Street. But there's, um, our CAG group has 23 uh, members on it, and we all came back and said, this is why you can't do that. The reason why Wolverine wanted to do it was because no uh, site in Michigan would accept their waste. So it is currently being trucked to Ohio and to Idaho. And whatever the cost is, that's not my problem. That, that's something that they have to deal with. Um, so what's particularly great for me with this community advisory group was that in the beginning I had so much anxiety about coming home and turning on the news because that was the only way I was finding out about what was going on to my house. Um, so now I'm on the communications group and we have a Facebook group and we have a website and we post um, as much materials as what we have and all of our meetings are public. So it's a place where it's residents helping residents. They can come in, they can ask questions, and now we have the resources to go and get answers and information. It's a, a huge source of relief. Um, so that's just for our community. Then we joined the NPAR group. The governor had um, formed this group, the Michigan PFAS Action Response Team. And so that's for the entire state of Michigan. Um, so Sandy and I sit on that as stakeholders that represent Northern Kent County. Um, and we were able to weigh in on the MCLs um, as they were being proposed to be lower and give our input on that. Um, they also contacted us when the Attorney General filed against the um, other polluters. And it's really nice that we actually get to meet these other folks from these other communities in Michigan. Um, so we meet on a monthly basis for that. Um, the other group is the it's a health department um, stakeholder group. When I found out that my water had been contaminated, um, I was able to get my blood tested. Blood testing is a really controversial issue with this. Um, a lot of regulators read, chemical companies will tell you, there's no reason to get your blood tested because we can't grow a correlation. Um, my blood came back at 5 million parts per trillion. Um, or 750 times what the average American has. Um, some people think it's the highest out there. I don't think it's like gold medal, medal worthy. I don't think this is a contest, but I think it shows um, how much is in there. The problem with this substance is these class of chemicals bioaccumulate. They don't leave. They don't break down. Um, you can't destroy them. So the more you drink, the more it stays, and it stays in tissues stays in your lungs, it stays in your liver, it stays in your spleen, it stays in your body, which is why we think um, it, it causes so much damage. So um, we had fought and fought to have um, the CDC start doing some blood um, testing and some health studies because you have this, sadly, this population of people that have been contaminated, so we might as well find out what this is going to do. You might as well use me as your guinea pig. Um, and figure out what's going to happen. So Jenny and I are on that, and then there's also a national PFAS coalition which looks at this around the country. I testified in Congress um, earlier this year, or, or late in 2019, um, and one of the people from Kentucky, Paul Rand, said, I don't need to be here because we don't have PFAS in Kentucky. And I thought, gosh, I've driven through Kentucky, dude. <laughs> Trust me, you've got some PFAS in Kentucky. Um, but I wasn't going to burst his bubble. He was probably having a bad day anyway. So, um, so those are just some of the things we've done. Um, so Sandy and I, um, with being involved in those different groups and organizations, we've come a long way in three years. Um, we've had the opportunity to speak with, we met a lady from Italy. She lives um, just north of Venice, 
and they kind of had the same thing. It was a manufacturer. Um, we met folks from the Netherlands um, who they are dealing with a high level of soil contamination. Um, and then also from Japan, it's a United States Air Force base that the, because um, PFAS is in firefighting foam. So that's leaching out of the Air Force base and into that population. Um, the problem with the PFAS is that it's still being produced today. And so we can all kind of do our part and make sure that we're not using products for our own safety um, that contains PFAS. But also, you know, the consumer um, kind of runs the business if you stop buying the product it's not going to be in such a high demand. Um, we have a lot of talented scientists and researchers, and I kind of um, feel like their hands get tied sometimes with the work that they do. Uh, they're funded a lot by industries for their grants and the universities that they work for. Um, so that may not be something that's always encouraged um, by those sponsoring those organizations, is to have this research come out. Um, so this has become our new normal. Um, there's the filters that Sandy was talking about. Um, and then she was having her house tested weekly. Um, since my levels are lower, I get tested every three months. And then you go through either filter changes and it's just a whole, it's a whole new lifestyle. Um, these are all the kids that live on House Street in Chandler. They kind of are buddy system. Um, my daughter is at a sleepover with one of our other one and one Wednesday girls. Um, so they kind of, they lean on each other as kids. One of the things with the health study that we had brought up was the mental health part of it. Um, so we're gonna, hopefully that's, what our new goal is to have a resource for parents to go to. Because when we found out about our water, how do you tell, my kids were seven and 14 at the time, how do you tell them, like, stop drinking the water, that's gonna hurt us, that's pretty traumatic. Uh, it's traumatic for an adult. So to kind of help that mental health, anxiety, um, but then back with the physical health. I now don't take any of the medications that I did, and I have very little health issues. Um, so I know, that once I got in clean water, I started to feel better after a year or so. Now I get mild headaches, um, I still have the eye pressure, um, but what's going to be very important about the health study that's going to happen in our area is that the C8 study only focused on two different chains of PFAS. We have five different ones, so health effects are going to be a little bit different. Um, so I'm really thankful that we're able to work together and, and make a lot of progress. So we do have those goals that we're going to work towards. So oh, I, I don't want this to be a depressing story. I mean, my story is kind of depressing. I try not to be, but um, it's kind of dismal, you know. I lost my husband to this. He was my best friend. I lost my travel buddy. Um, I lost the person I could yell at when he wants to go to concerts. Um, I lost the value of my home. We worked really hard to pay our home home. Most people, that is your investment. That's what you're investing in the future. And I couldn't give my home away right now because of the contamination. Um, I have come to accept the fact that there's a pretty good chance that this contamination will probably result in what I die from, and that it's just a fact of life. Um, but I want you to know that if you are steady on what your goals are and you work with legislators, and you are demanding and respectful, you can push for change. And we don't push for change because of us, we push for change because of those kids there, the 22 kids that live within a quarter mile of this dump site um, on House Street in Chandler. So please use this to motivate you to move and do different. Thank you.
that will give you kind of a lot of links to go to and a lot of updated things. But as far as the Wine and Water Wednesday gal, we just drink wine and talk water. And usually it's on Wednesday, but we're kind of flexible then. <laughs> Um, so this is about selling our house. I have, um, no, we're, we're definitely not going to put it on the market for fear that it really has decreased in value. Um, yeah, you can't safely use your water. Um, we are in litigation with Wolverine, and that is, um, part of it is the loss of value of our house. Um, and really just the stress of coming home every day. It's so stressful to pull in the driveway after a long day of work. It's like, oh, this is not a happy place anymore. Um, but then there's the fact of when you sell your home, like what do you have to disclose? Uh, there's, we're working with the um, Realtor Association to make sure that gets kind of on one of those mandatory disclosure lists because nobody else should buy a house that's then stuck being in the situation we're in. Yeah. Okay, this question is what discovery or situation caused that very first state person to contact Sandy and start this conversation. Well, this is kind of a funny story in a sick and twisted way. So, they knew, DEQ knew all along this dump site was there and never told any of us, okay? Keep in mind, the previous administration worked with industry, right? DEQ and industry were kind of hand in hand here. They were testing the water north of the dump site, even though water traveled south, okay? and say, I'm not busy here, folks, everyone go on with your way. Um, but, here's what's funny. I, we had a church in the neighborhood that's literally, I can see from my back door. And if you know anything about Grand Rapids, we have a couple bazillion churches. <laughs> this church went bankrupt. That never happens in Grand Rapids. And it was bought by an armory, so we have a Belmont National Guard armory, because I don't know, Belmont needs a National Guard. But it turned out to be kind of fate, because part of the military has to test for PFAS in their water. Well, dang if the National Guard Armory didn't test for PFAS and it came back positive over the 70 parts per trillion, and that tripped all the rest of this worker. So I keep saying God had to shut the church down, just so that we would all know that. So. It was a whole series of weird coincidences. Yes. Um, how many contamination sites in Michigan have been identified? I believe we're at about 40, um, and that's, there's municipal water systems um, that the state went through and tested all of, I think, 40,000 users or more municipal water systems, which we need to go down from that. Everybody's drinking water, so it doesn't matter where you are, you should be tested. Um, a cool one that would, it, none of this is cool, but I thought that it was a neat story. Um, the Pelston, right before you get to um, the bridge, um, Pelston Airport, um, some kids in the area, there were kids that got a testing kit and thought we should test, and they found PFAS. So I just thought that was really neat that we're encouraging this next generation um, to kind of look for this stuff. Um, and then has Wolverine um, had to identify their dump sites? They were not even owning up to House Street. And if you look um, on who owns what parcels of land, their name's on it. Um, there's a gravel pit that's just to the north of us that suspect that it was Wolverine that dumped there, but they won't um, confess to that. Um, we also have a golf course around the corner that used to be a gravel pit. That's where everybody dumped before, was gravel pits. Um, there's a cell that's in there that they dumped in, but they're not coming 100%. There, there's, there's more to come, I believe. Um, so I have a couple questions here about filters. So my whole home filter got, gets tested weekly, and they test at where the water comes into the filter, and that's where it'll usually be 60, 70, 80,000 parts per trillion. They test at the midpoint, so after two, runs through the granular activated carbon, and that's always zero, they say, and then at the end they say it's always zero. Everybody's a little stunned that these gag filters have held up so well. Call me suspicious, but hence I drink the Culligan water. Um, there, I, I do want to point, gag filters are really good at getting long chain, so PFAS is an eight chain carbon. 
There are shorter chains that they make now that supposedly don't last as long. They buy, they don't bioaccumulate. They get out of your bloodstream quicker. So somehow that's supposed to make us feel better. But gag filters don't remove the short chain filters. A combination of a gag filter and a reverse osmosis filter is supposed to be really good. Whole home reverse osmosis filters are usually very, very expensive though. So most people have point of use under the sink reverse osmosis filters. But those are actually really good. We happen to have one in our house that we used in our kitchen. We just only used it periodically because it's a really small thing and it was kind of a pain and it was weak and all that stuff. So, um, so what, it says what levels of PFAS are present after going through your home filter programs? I assume that means in my GAC filter, and, and it filters it out to zero, they tell me. So that's what they say. So. Um, the thoughts are um, whether it's being addressed, the health effects to animals and to the ecosystem and environment. Um, my husband's a hunter. He is a, a bird hunter. He does ducks and geese. We have like a plethora of ducks in our house. Um, that's currently not studied, but I continue to tell everybody that I can get my hands on. We need to study. I don't know how that would happen. They migrate. Um, but I know in Oscoda, where the Wordsmith Air Force Base is, they do have um, a, like a no-eat deer zone, because um, apparently only deer go within a five-mile radius. Um, I don't think I would eat any deer up there. Um, and then the fish. We do have fish advisories, so the DEQ was really good about looking at the fish. Um, but yeah, really, that's kind of one of my like, we need to get the birds tested. Um, and then where the waste is being transported, is there going to be a new contamination site? In my opinion, absolutely, because where they're transporting it to is a licensed site, which means underneath uh, where they're dumping everything is a really thick liner. Um, but there's a chemical benzene. I think it is that will actually eat through the liner. So if at some point somebody comes in and dumps benzene, it's going to poke holes through the liner, and then yeah. So there's probably going to be more. Um, oh, goals for laws to require location of a dump site. You know, I don't personally know how you can even like put this anywhere that it's going to be safe. Um, but we definitely have to look at it. This is one weird thing that our Geology 101, we learned about how septic tanks work. And um, so as far as like the dump sites with that, we're worried with having such a high amount of PFAS that float into our septic tanks. When that comes time to get changed, where is that going to go? Um, I don't know where that end point is. If it goes to a wastewater treatment plant, does that plant know that they have to filter? Um, before they just dump it out, filter it for PFAS, um, does it go to a landfill, is that going to be a licensed landfill? Hopefully it doesn't get spread onto our field, so then go through that whole chain. Okay, and I guess this is our last question. What kind of product should we try to avoid that contain PFAS? So, PFAS is in Scotchgard, that's the number one thing, in Teflon. Lowe's and Home Depot have said they will no longer apply Scotchgard to their carpets and fabrics, so that's good. So I would encourage people not to Scotchgard your fabrics, your furniture, your carpet. Um, Teflon, of course, is one. You will see a lot of things that now say PFAS free. Um, that's mostly because they don't make it anymore, but they do make what are called Gen X chemicals, which are the same things. That is what are the new class of Teflons. So don't be tricked. Um, they, it's in food wrappers, it's quite a bit in food wrappers, it's what keeps the grease from seeping out. So pizza boxes, in fact we had several legislators tell me my rates were so high because I probably ate a lot of pizza. And I said I think I would have to have illegal congress with some pizza boxes to get rates this high. It had nothing to do with pizza boxes. Um, so bio sludge is a big issue. We take wastewater that can be contaminated and waste product that's contaminated with PFAS and then we dump this stuff on farm fields. There is a huge issue with um, dairy farmers possibly having PFAS contamination in the milk, but the Department of Agriculture does not want to test milk because, well, we, we like farmers and they work hard and they already have 
I mean, I, I get why we're worried about it, but if we don't address the issue, we're going to continue with the problem. We have to be smart about it. I met a farmer down in Arizona that lives next to an uh, Air Force base, and he had 400,000 cattle, and they've all been wiped out now. His, he's lost everything because of this. A triple F firefighting phone. If you live near a um, airport or a, a military base of any kind, chances are your groundwater is contaminated. I will tell you, they don't routinely test wells, they only test municipal systems. I will also tell you if you want a cheap home kit that you can use to do a preliminary test, go to Freshwater Futures. They do a kit for $60 that they will test for your PFAS levels, so send it to you and you send it back. They do have some false positives with that, but at least it will give you a baseline idea of where you are. Okay, so sorry we ran over. Here, take the mic, run, run. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Sandy and Jenny.